Not it. I Good morning, sound. Barney McDermott. Good morning, Bill Uliveri. How are you? Former, former OEX, an equity extraordinaire trader, BAM uh, was your badge. Uh, you stood almost 100%, like almost 180 degrees opposite of me, where you were along the railing by the call book. I leaned against the railing in the put book at the OEX bit. So thanks for joining us today on the Blockchain Advisor. Uh, let's you know dive right into the interview and tell me all these things. What's your background? Uh, who backed you? How did you get started? What brought you to the CBOE? What was your trading style? Did you were you a sheet reader? Like all that stuff. So let's just begin at the beginning. How did you how did you get into options and which was at the time pretty quirky investment derivative that was relatively new. It was very new at the time. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, my father was always a, uh, a trader of some sort. And he got involved on the Philadelphia uh, Options Exchange. Just when it started, you know, I think the exchange is open in 73 or 74. Mm -hmm. And so he got involved fairly early and he was reasonably successful and I would clerk for him. I was in college at the time. I would clerk for him over the summers. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of in my blood. And when he came out to Chicago, cause he was, you know, reasonably successful in Philadelphia, came out to Chicago to play in the big leagues. And so after I graduated, I joined him and clerked for him. He was trading IBM at the time. And I remember uh, standing in the back of the pit, watching the trading, not knowing what the heck was going on. But eventually I noticed that uh, there was spread trading, which meant uh, buying one option and selling another option. And that tended to be fairly stable. It didn't move around like the regular options did. Uh, it was a pair of options and it was fairly stable. So I would kind of watch those and memorize those. And in my mind, when the traders or when the brokers were calling out markets for those, I would, in my head, make a market. Um, and after about a year of clerking for my dad, he started me on the Midwest uh, Options Exchange. And I kind of had a game plan already going in was to trade spreads. And literally that was my strategy for 25 years was to uh, always have uh, a hedge to uh, a, a trade I made. 90% of the time I would always hedge my trades. Uh, so that to start out, that was my strategy. I was, uh, my badge was R11. We started on that. I started on the Midwest the options exchange, calling it an exchange. Uh, it's kind of funny because you're basically the the room we were in was the size of your living room. Um, there were very few stocks, I think, um, and most 20 stocks. But they did have five um, put stocks. And so I was attracted to trading the puts uh, as well as the calls. So uh, I went to that pit, which was Corning Glass, Carrier, and Bristol Myers. Right. Bristol Myers, I remember that, and Corning, sure. Uh, and Bristol Myers, Bristol Myers was interesting because uh, you know the other stocks, Carrier, Carrier was a takeover candidate, um, so it was crazy. But and Corning Glass was your red kind of a regular stock that had its ups and downs. Bristol Myers would never go down. That's what I remember. Um, you know, as market makers, we're put in a position usually of selling calls. I mean, that's most of what we did uh, when you made a market, the public uh, would be in there to buy calls. So you'd be selling calls in Bristol Myers and you'd never win on them. You'd have to uh, hedge with the stock or else you were not going to make money selling Bristol Myers calls. And about what year was it again, roughly? Okay, um, graduated school in 78 and by probably the end of 79, uh, I was trading. Sure. And uh, I, I lived with my dad. We used to take the 22 bus down, oh down Clark God. Street. Uh, I can't tell you where the exchange was. It was in a building, though, that was not near 
um, the Board of Trade. But it was just like a room in a building. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't an exchange floor as we know them or think about them. So um, after at, at some point, I started trading uh, Superior Oil. Um, and then when that moved to the CBOE, I moved to the CBOE as well. Okay. And that was quite a trade or two. That was another takeover in the date. And that was uh, my, the one time I nearly was knocked out of the business was in Superior Oil. Really? Yes. When, uh, uh, as often seems to be the case, the day or two before takeover, option activity seems to pick up and a lot of buyers show up. I don't know why. Maybe they have inside information. Who would think? Yeah. Maybe um, that would never happen. Right? No, no. And, and so on a Friday, um, towards the end of the day, I'm selling calls and the brokers are coming in and saying, where can I buy this? Where can I buy that? And I was selling them because that's what I did. Right. Sunday, they announced the takeover. And I'm figuring out the stock was probably, I believe it was like 38 and a half or something it closed. On Friday, I was selling the 40 options and the takeover was at 48. So I was projecting my position as if these calls, which I was selling at half a dollar, three quarters of a dollar, a dollar, were now $8. And I was out of business. So uh, coming in Monday morning, you know, I was ready to throw in the towel. But miraculously, uh, $48 was lower than everybody expected to take over to be. So the stock really didn't move much. And I was able to liquidate and survive. Right. I remember that I, I came in and my trading sheets had a delta of zero, which was very rare for as many positions as we had on. And I do remember having a lot of anxiety coming into Monday morning, but really it was sort of a non-event that day. All the hype was pre-announcement of the of the takeover, which mobile, I think it was mobile that came in and, and bought it. Yeah. And the specifics, now the details, I don't remember quite well, but I just remember for me, it was like a huge sigh of relief coming in Monday and just not that big of a deal because I was a box trader for the most part. So I didn't, so I didn't like risk. So uh, I was grateful that it did. It opened up right. with like nothing. Well, I would, I trade, I traded boxes. I traded reversals and conversions as well. Anything I thought, you know, I could make money at, I, w I would do. Um, but usually I wound up uh, with a risk position. You know, I trade the back months. Mm -hmm. And uh, or I just make markets and you wind up with a risk position. Sure. Now, did you did you take your position apart manually like most of us did? Or were you already savvy enough to use uh, Schwarzatron or a micro hedge machine to download and analyze? You had a clerk do it for you and give you your card. That's right. I had a clerk do it for me. I had a program. I can't tell you the name of it. Um, I, I think I paid about $2,000 for it. Um, I had a program that would run on a laptop, you know, 386. <laughs> 386. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that would give me my deltas and gammas. And, uh, but I also added, um, I believe it was, Lo yeah, Lotus uh, spreadsheet. Lotus 123. <laughs> uh -huh. Lotus spreadsheet on my 386. Um, would also further break down the position uh, in a way that, you know, I could look at it and understand it. It wasn't, that was something I wrote. That wasn't something that was commercial. Sure. Um, but yeah, I would have my clerk and clerk, having a clerk was invaluable, I want to say, because we, we were talking about this yesterday and Virginia was the name of my clerk. Ah, and, yes. Uh, um, it was invaluable having her because not only would she calculate or help calculate my position, she would trade check for me, mm -hmm. you know? So big, I made big. sure I didn't have out trades and, and out trades are 
it could be devastating. Sure. And so you, you, you kind of, even though you had clerked for your dad in IBM, you had kind of cut your teeth in superior oil in the brown stocks, like many of us did. It was a low cost way of getting in. Because yes. at the time, the brown room was maybe, I, I, brought, I, I borrowed $20,000 $20, to get a brown badge seat, which allowed you to trade, like you said, about 20 stocks. Uh, Superior Oil, Northwest Industries, Nitwit I was in. Uh, yes. Mid, just like Southern Utilities, like MSU yes, or something. MSU. Was MSU. MSU was one of them. I was in that one for a while. Wasn't um, Use Tool or? Yeah, huge, huge right, the huge tool huge was there. Tool, yeah. <laughs> huge tool, yeah. Huge tool. But it was a great way to get started at relatively low cost. And I traded for an entire year, learned how, what to do, what not to do. But really, my first year, I think I made, at the end of it all, like 800 bucks. I mean, I... Yeah, no, I was... I remember starting off, too, and I was a loser immediately. Uh, it took some time before I figured it out. But, you know, trading the uh, low-risk stuff like you did with the boxes and stuff, which I did do in reversals and conversion. Mm -hmm. eventually figure it out yeah and uh the other thing is uh you learned that selling puts was usually pretty nice it worked out usually worked out pretty well um which then leads to f potential future disasters but yes. um in 1987 comes well, to mind let's talk about that what what did you were you a did you struggle during that time period? Because volatility was incredibly high. Market was all over the place. How, like, what was your experience? What were your memories of the crash of 87? No, that I will never forget. Luckily, because I, I was there, you know, to trade in 88 and 89. Luckily, I was long, I was long volatility. So I was fortunate. I was able to trade. But my memory was that uh, things got so crazy people left the pit the pit was empty mm -hmm. um or normally OX, oex pit had 300 people in it i think on the tuesday morning there were about 30 people in it yeah and um the the opening on tuesday morning got crazier and crazier i remember i'll never forget that because i sold some i think it was either the the 240 strike. Yeah, I think it was a 240 strike I sold. And then we got down to the 180s and I was selling the 180 strike at the same price I sold the 240 strike. I, re I remember that. So um, it was, you know, the volatility was crazy. And uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money. I mean, a lot of people who stood around me uh, weren't there, you know, the next week. So that was, was sad too. Right. Well, I unfortunately uh, went debit coming in. I, I had an October versus November out trade and puts, oh, no. and I had, I had to come in. But luckily, I covered them. I remember I covered them from Paul Evans, CRT, on mm -hmm. opening rotation. The puts I sold for uh, pennies, I bought back in you know, double digit quantities. Yes. And then, then they went to like, go triple that by the time you know the day was over so i was yeah. grateful that I, I i did i'd really got hurt but it wasn't so bad that it put me completely out of business and i was back in the next day i'm like okay i got that over with let's let's do this kind of thing so for a guy that was 27 i think i handled it pretty well yeah. all things considering i would say if you if you survive you handled it pretty well because you know as i said you know, half the people around me were gone after that. So uh, it was crazy. So did you, you know, once you kind of, you, you said you were doing conversions and reversals and getting settled in, but would you say that your OEX position, your OEX strategy was to do the one five as a conversion reversal, or did you primarily just do spreads? Cause you were by the call book, you were by the Schwab brokers primarily, maybe Dean Witter right behind you. I seem to remember. I, I had, Frank, uh, FHW, I'm going to try not to use names to protect the guilty. And that's a okay. joke. I'm going to, I know I'm going to, I'm going to have him on because he's Frank is yeah, he's a, a great, great guy. guy. A great yeah. guy. All right. So, um, he was behind me. John Hargett was behind me. Uh, uh, yeah. I should have said H A R. Um, I'll try to stick to the, uh, acronyms, but anyway, you had Schwab, 
Dean Witter, DRA was over there. Um, Oppenheimer would float in and come near us. So yeah, there was a good access um, into the paper at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, that was a, a great a great time. Did you uh, did, were you did you were the type of person that just stayed in the pit and like really never left between the opening bell and the closing bell, or did you like many of us? You know, we didn't trade when it was slow. We just went upstairs and played Tetris or backgammon or went to the uh, not the East Bank Club, but the one over by South. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. That big new complex that was South. You left out the sign of the trader. <laughs> sign of the trader. <laughs> that too. Where I would go. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, I was not. At first, I was uh, would be there all day. But uh, as you point out. During the middle of the day, there wasn't much going on. So uh, going to have lunch or something. Um, eventually, I started taking naps in the middle of the day. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the action was from uh, 8.30 to 11 and then from 1 to 3.15. Sure. After the bounce closed, things were busy. And, and I didn't answer your previous question about what my strategy was uh, in the OAX. And, and basically, I did do the 1.5. Um, it was hard to do boxes and impossible. I mean, the, the reverse, you know, the reversal conversion with the one five is not, was not a riskless trade as you right. know. Um, so I would use the S and P's to hedge, but I didn't do the one five much, maybe, um, during near expiration or something that would happen, but. I basically, my strategy was always, I would always have an out whenever I made a trade. I would always have something I could hedge with, it, it, be it the S&P or another option, a, front, a liquid front month option. So I could for, kind of forget about, I make the trade, hedge it, and then go on to the next thing, kind of forget about, not have to worry about, oh, I just did a hundred lot. Um, you know, now I've got to worry about this thing all day until I get out of it. I would hedge it in some fashion and then I could go on to the next thing. Sure, sure. And so, you know, after leaving the floor, I would say, well, actually for most of my career, and I'm sure like you, they always, people would always compare traders to what they saw in Wall Street or, um, uh, you know, th these these financial shows, the, the wolf of Wall Street, where it was always, you know, drugs and cocaine and and prostitutes and all this bad behavior. But as I was having a conversation yesterday with uh, Larry Berlin, Z.O.E. was his badge. You know, we both agreed that for the most part, like 99 percent of all the people we knew down there. I mean, they were there was they were honest and they had integrity and they're it sounds cliche to say it today, but their word was their bond. And if you made a trade with them, it was good. And I think for the most part, people carried that outside the exchange. At least that was my experience. Like, would you say that you had a lot of bagged actors you were dealing with? Or did you feel no, pretty much the same way? I, I agree with you. Um, in order to survive survive down there, you, had to, you just had to be honest. I mean, it was part of the culture. Um, you're, as you said, the, the motto of the London Stock Exchange, my word is my bond. And that really was kind of the trading mantra. If you weren't uh, good for your trades, you you couldn't uh, you couldn't work there really. No one would trade with you. I mean, it just it had to be in your nature. Yeah, otherwise you get a person like that. And, and you know, of course, Hollywood is going to exaggerate. Uh, you know, there's some of that stuff was there, of course, but of course, Hollywood is going to exaggerate and, and you know take the the worst things and and uh, make that uh so you make the movie exciting or sure. you know a trip into a world people don't experience and so barney when did you leave the trading floor when did you say that you wanted to try something different and maybe trade electronically or screen based or did you just never make that transition um i remember discussing this with the uh, top um at the time, we, we knew that floor trading was not long uh, to exist anymore. So I did try uh, trading 
market making off the floor, that didn't work very well because <laughs> they were a lot faster. You know, the, the fastest computer won once the trading became uh, electronic, just the people who were co-located and, and had the high speed connections were, were able to kind of dominate the trade. Um, I continued to, I would call it day trade mm -hmm. for about 10 years after. Um, but yeah. that was com a completely different experience. What um, year, what years were that? What were those 10 years that you day traded? I would floor, say so? from about 2000, four to 2015 so maybe 11 years well that's pretty good that's amazing yeah I, I, yeah well <laughs> it, it wasn't anything like uh what we were doing on the oh, floor I, I mean the strategies are completely different it took a long time to develop strategies and uh you know, you couldn't do a box off the floor. No, you for couldn't, sure. You couldn't do a reversal and conversion. You know, you couldn't do a butterfly. I guess you can, but uh, it was, uh, you weren't going to get the kind of prices you would get. Yeah, I have a, uh, a friend that had a out-of-the-money call butterfly on in the OEX. This goes back to maybe 2012. And something happened where the marks from the night before, like the day before volatility, the marks put this butterfly, which was basically worth zero, at like a $3 de uh, debit the other way. Like they marked it way under because it oh, was sure. bad marks. Well, the, the auto execution, auto, we're getting you out of the position. Oh, no. Algorithm oh, no. kicked in the next day. And he actually ended up selling a butterfly that was basically worth worthless at zero, sold it for like $16 under because it was like sell at the market, buy twice as many at the market, sell at the market. And it was the most horrific auto execution trade the world has ever known. The, the risk the risk manager or the program that ever, that analyzes this should have just left the butterfly at zero rather than selling it out for uh, a, a credit. Right, I mean, that's, uh... Well, the machines don't know everything, I guess. Uh, <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. So did you stay in contact now, Barney, with anybody from the trading floor? Did you? Well, yeah, FHW, I, I, I'm still friendly with. Um, but not many, not many people. Um, I, I really don't. I really don't mm -hmm. stay in contact with many people. I do look at your uh, uh, Facebook group, but I really don't, you know, it's a different world, a different time. Yeah. I know, and and I, as I was saying, saying to you yesterday that what really inspired me to do these interviews was really two days ago, where I I decided that you know the overheard at CBUE Facebook group has become more of like an obituary notification page where the mm -hmm. people we grew up with, the people we interacted with, I mean, they're that generation is is dying. Uh, you know, one of the uh, was it. Uh, Steve Clement, no, one of the Clement guys that started CRT, he recently passed away. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. There, I heard that John Downey passed away recently. From, John Downey, yeah. John Downey. Wow. And so, you know, these were the guys that started on the, ex these were the guys that kind of started. And, and I just think about, we take so much for granted with algorithmic trading and using Robinhood to buy and sell. And we have all these fancy apps that we can invest in. But it wasn't always like that. We had paper trading cards. It was open outcry. We would write our, our, the seller of an option was responsible for reporting the ticket and we would tear it off and put it into a belt which mechanically like a conveyor belt shuffled this ticket into a bin that people that then the exchange employees were just filling out and getting I mean it was like 20 minutes delayed it was, or more it was just an right. incredible right. like I'm glad uh, you brought that up I mean the, the differences between now and then are uh, you know just amazing um, yeah we we that's and that uh, goes into the trust thing. I mean, we're flashing signals across the pit and you're trusting that the other person is writing down the trade after we haven't spoken, we're just hand signaled it. Right. Eye contact. <laughs> yeah, I con yeah, right. He, he's bidding and you just throw a hand at him and wave a hand at him and uh, you know, he says a hundred or something or 50 or what 10 or whatever the number is. And that's how you made a business transaction, which 
might be worth a million dollars or something um, <laughs> just with a nod and a hand wave. So that's, you know, uh, you were talking about the importance of uh, honesty, uh, or we were, I right. was anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, for, despite the chaos, it ran, it was pretty remarkably how, uh, how remarkable how efficient it really was, I have to say. It, it worked. I mean, the system worked, except the night, you know, the whole uh, stock market and the financial world kind of fell apart in 87. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. that was a, a near collapse of that, that system. But our system worked pretty darn well, pretty darn well. It sure did. It Not sure as did. well as electronic trading, though, unfortunately. Well, I don't, I don't think I know anybody who successfully for a long period of time was able to transfer off the floor. Those skills, and it's the, the, it's, it's the people skills. It was the, you could feel the volatility. You could feel the market change. It wasn't technical analysis per se. It wasn't always the Federal Reserve policy. It wasn't this kind of news that we get today. It was, you could just, you could tell when this emotion was building, this ebb and flow. And so we all actually became very intuitive Yes. Despite the fact that we were working with options and derivatives and numbers and delta, gamma, theta, all the Greeks, we still, it was very, very intuitive and empathetic in a way. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but you could just feel stuff. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, I think of the uh, quote from uh, Rothschild, buy, you buy when the blood is running in the streets. Well, in the OEX, you buy when you can see their tonsils. <laughs> that, that right. Is, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. It, you got so much information, as you say, um, just from human being interaction and behavior that you don't get off the floor um, looking at a screen. I mean, the the volume of the traders, sound, the, you know, the volume of the voices, etc., would give you. Uh, a feel for what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so any other memories that stand out in your mind, uh, Barney, back then, anything that just, you know, could have been your worst day ever, your best day ever, something that happened to someone around you, um, a, a news day, a challenger explosion, like, I don't know, like what, what kind of stands out for you as, again, for me, it, w it was the crash of 87. Yeah, that, I, that stands above all. Yeah. I mean, that was the most amazing, incredible, horrible, wonderful, depending on your position. Right. Um, I do remember, you know, my best trade, we, we can discuss that. Um, I think it was, it was in 80, November of 89. And I remember I was flat for the year and I wasn't happy about that, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, there, I think it was, United Airlines, United Airlines was involved in a merger and they called it off. Right. And the, and the market sold off hard when they called it off. And, you know, I stood near the book mm -hmm. and, you know, th there's the, the panic all around us. Tonsils are flaring, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. Right. And uh, I'm looking in the book for something to do. Uh, you know, what can I do here? And there was a bid for 900 options at $36 in the call book. And so me and Tommy Henrik both noticed this and we looked at each other and it was like, do we do this? Do we do? And we did it. And it was a big winner. Wow. A big winner. So um, <laughs> I still talk I mean, to Tommy I mean, now and then. I, I stared at it for a couple of minutes thinking, I mean, that was, that's a huge trade. That was a huge trade. And uh, am I going to, do we want to do this? And Henrik was, do you see this? And uh, we did it. So that was my best trade. Yay. Yay. Yeah. And you closed, you closed in 20, uh, 1989 on a positive note. Yeah, I made money for 1989. Next day, we were in the market continued down the next day. We were, I, I was able to close it at a decent profit i want to share sure. but you didn't know being the spreader though you didn't just carry those things overnight naked i mean you must have hedged i some, did carry it overnight naked because it was about 255 <laughs> and and <laughs> um 
I'm not going to buy, you know, uh, I don't know how many spies I would have had to buy a hundred spies. I don't know, something like that. Um, but I wasn't going to do that. So I carried it. And they, that one I did carry naked. Let me see, did I? What I did was I did hedge it the next morning immediately mm -hmm. and then worked out of that. Sure. They would, almost be, I, they would almost be 200 spoos at the time. I'm guessing, you know, five to one, you're selling almost a thousand, you know, it in was money. A, it was a, it wasn't a front month though. It was like, a, you know, last month option. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a hundred Delta type situation. Okay. It might've been a 60 or 70. So yeah, a hundred, 200, somewhere in there. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not going to do that kind right. of size. Right. Spoo. Um, so that was that was memorable yeah especially since you know the year hadn't gone well and yeah in the year or two after the crash the options market wasn't what it was i mean it kind of took a hiatus while uh, people kind of absorbed what really happened and then the market picked up again eventually sure well, I, I do remember that, you know, the, what I lost in the 87 crash, I kind of made back in the 89 mini crash. Mm. Then after that, we, we had the Gulf War situation and we kind of hit a little bit of a recession, I guess, in the market from, say, late 80, like maybe early 1990 into 92-ish. I seem to remember, like memory is not 100%, but I do remember my struggle in that post-89 crash scenario was the fact that business was so slow and the sheet readers in the Timber Hills and Susquehanna's were... Uh, were becoming more active, and it was just really hard to make my seat lease, which was, I don't know, ten thousand dollars a month plus yeah, you're spending eighteen percent uh, of the seat at the yeah. Very so uh, yeah, the seat lease was. I was able to get my after the eighty-seven crash. I was able to get my own seat. So good, good. That was uh, lucky on my part. But yeah, the seat lease was a. That was a great investment to buy a seat. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the where they are now, did you ever Didn't hold it though? Did you ever sneak over to the board of trade uh, and get no, trade no. grains in the summertime when things were slow with the SIBO? No, I, I I really stayed on the SIBO. I didn't go over the board of trade or the Merck or anything like that. Okay. So any regrets looking back in hindsight? If you could do anything different, what what would you do? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um. I had a business notion. Uh, I don't want to go into it, but there were a couple. Of, I had a couple of business ideas while I was trading that maybe um, would have made sense, knowing that uh, I, trading as we knew it wasn't always going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I w would have liked to have get involved more with the handhelds. And uh, I remember Shelly, well, well Shelly's, I don't remember his acronym, but uh, we, I have to use a name. Shelly Brown sure. was involved with those uh, handhelds and get involved in that or even get involved with uh, think or Swim would have been a nice idea. Right, right. But I didn't. So, so when, so That's in the late... Regret. In the late 80s and early 90s, when we started to do things hybrid, when the electronic trading card came down, and I remember uh, George Doherty, you know, the scalper, had the, he was one of the first people on the pilot program. And so right. I, kind of, I kind of believed that we would be this perfect um, amalgam, this perfect consolidation, hybridization of in-person with electronic. And I never dreamed that we would go as electronic as we did, as computer-driven as we did. So I feel a little bit foolish that, you know, maybe it was the, because the movie RoboCop was popular back then, like part man, part machine. I really felt mm -hmm. that floor traders were still going to have an incredible longevity and it was not going to be a problem. But little by little, boy, those computer, you know, technology just crashed and we had super fast computers and the regulatory environment was such that it wasn't an, an onerous um, burden on, on trading firms. Um, and so I just I feel I feel a little bit foolish that maybe my perception of what the future of trading looked like was it's it's nothing like how it turned out. It's it was yeah, and okay. So for my part, thinking that I could apply my 
on floor trading techniques to off floor trading uh, was really foolish. I mean, I really regret that. Yeah. That's okay. It, yeah, we, we, we all know, did. I guess we all did that. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it was great to be around. It was a great experience. And oh, the, you know, the trading floor, there was nothing like it. It was like, like I said to you yesterday, um, it was like competing in pro sports. You know, you're competing every day. It was somewhat physical. Um, you know, you had to yell and scream and fight. and uh, But still make wise decisions. Mm -hmm. So it was very, you know, it was exciting. It was exciting. And did you have a traditional uh, educational background? I mean, most of the people that were down there, you know, may not have gone to college, I mean, did not no, have I an had, MBA. I, I didn't have, I had a traditional uh, educational experience. I did not go to graduate school though, but I did graduate college, I had a math degree. Uh, so I was kind of, this was kind of perfect for me. Good. Excellent. Yeah. And well, you know, I, in the trading pit, you're always trying to squeeze into a little spot by a broker. And I remember standing most of my days on a half of a ledge yeah. with, my back against, with my back against the price reporting machine. So the fact that I don't have this huge tumor on my back, because that's where the cathode ray tube was, that TV, <laughs> that, that long neck with a, some kind of magnetic thing, high voltage thing. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that I still have yeah. you know, a spine left because I, you know. <laughs> Well, I remember being on the rail. Um, well, I got to remember the guy's name, but he was a bodybuilder, about 250 pounds. Kelman, and one of the Kelman Kevin brothers. Uh, Dave. Yes, yeah. massive guns. Must, you know, just a 250 pound block of muscle. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget when I, you know, I'm against the rail. And when he went for the book, man, I got hit like it was. I was get like getting hit by, by Butkus, you know. Absolutely, I remember him. <laughs> what pounded? Right. <laughs> I do remember you... that. That's why I say it was physical. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, you know, the people throwing shoes at the book. You remember that? Oh yeah, I remember um, David Shorvitz climbing up the book to attack Kenny Silverstein, who was the board <laughs> broker, because he disrespected him somehow. So it was. Yeah quite the characters in that in that trading pit and you had you had the 250 pounds of muscle behind you and you had danny Vivers, who was no slouch either right behind you i think he I'm was a danny, yeah and danny was a bodybuilder too yeah so uh fortunately he didn't crash you know he didn't knock me over because he was beneath me and you know but calman was next to me or right next you know so <laughs> yeah. man bruises i mean it was like yeah i he'd hit you with a forearm shiver that felt like a, a you know a steel beam and hit you right lucky he didn't want that 900 lot of calls at 36 dollars because he would have... have thank god <laughs> <laughs> exactly so yeah all right barney any uh, any closing comments or thoughts anything you want to wrap up with anything you want to shamelessly self-promote a business idea a website uh, anything like that just no, to kind of help I'm you i'm not going to self-promote but I, i'm going to say that uh those are the best years of my life, really, uh, being on the trading floor. I look forward to going to work every day. Um, the camaraderie was great. Uh, we had a lot of fun. If you were making, I mean, if you're making a living, you have a lot of fun. Right. Um, and I, you know, I just enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a shame that we, we don't have that anymore. I know. It really is. I, I, yeah. And that, that's what I got for you. Well, that's great. Wilson, thanks for joining me. Uh, again, permission to post this on Spotify for my uh, my channel. Uh, I may end up posting it in the overheard CBOE just because I want to try to keep this camaraderie and this tight knit community that we had. Um, so, you know, if you if you know, think about it, if you're OK with it, then I'd like to, you know, get your permission yeah, to do I'm that. Sure. Um, sure. I, I would I would like to if, if it does make Spotify, I'd like to know about it. Sure. Maybe hear it beforehand. I mean, did I did I say anything that was you were I don't you were the cleanest guy that I've talked to so far because being on the trading floor we swore all day long. Oh my God! It was a, <laughs> it was a high school locker room. <laughs> yeah, no, and even if you did swear or use inappropriate language, I'm okay because I tell people that what we grew up, you know, 
he had 500 guys literally just using the F word all day long. And we, it's lost its meaning. And I think we just use it because that's just what we did, you know? And yeah, no, that was, that's absolutely right. I mean, no, <laughs> oh. this is not a G rated channel. So you're, we're okay. You're okay. And yeah, that was a different world. Uh, just a different world. I mean, you, you, you looked at from today's perspective, uh, we were heathens. Yes. You know? And I've got, I have three daughters, right? And one yeah. son. And so I, and, and there, we get into conversations at Thanksgiving or Christmas or the holidays. And we talk about being politically correct or incorrect. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Do you know what the hand signal for Drexel Burnham was? That's inappropriate. But we were in a big locker room of guys. Like we didn't, we didn't, we just. And I thought of the other one what was Wedbush. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And on that. On that note, we're going to close. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Barney, thank you so much, man. We'll see you later. Right. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care.